1979, I'm in Searchman Quarters watching TV with my grandmother. Saturday at 5 o'clock, okay? Child, Rickety James and Tina Marie came on. I'm like, why is that white lady, grandma, why is that white lady singing for that lady? What is going on? Is, is Tina Marie sick? <laughs> So please remember to like, share, and subscribe because it is so important to my success here on the YouTube. And if you have not checked out checked out my Poshmark store, please hit the link below. And if there is not anything that you want now, there may be something that you are interested in later. So go ahead and follow me. Y'all know I done told y'all next year I'm fitting to be 50. And I got a good birthday gift that I want to buy for myself. Now, let's talk about Tina Marie, Unsung. This is a good old throwback, but, you know, I'm going to put my judge on it. So anyway, they opened the show with the 2004 BET Awards. And it is Rickety James and Tina Marie in the audience singing Fire and Desire. Okay. Now, they mentioned it. But what they forgot to mention was that that shit was a hot mess. Uh, Tina Marie and Rickety James, I know y'all together in heaven singing Fire and Desire, but I know the goddamn Tina Marie was like, Rick, what is you doing, bro? What is you singing? Are you singing yesterday or today? Now we get into the grassroots. Tina Marie was named Mary Christine Brockett of Santa Monica, California. Her family called her from the very beginning Tina Marie. Okay, now she okay. said her father's uh, favorite singer was Ella Fitzgerald. Tina Marie's favorite singer of all time, she said it was her most favoritist, was Sarah Vaughn. This is when her mother figured out, oh, wait a minute, I got a little performer on my hands. Yeah. Now her mammy was embarrassed, and let me tell you the story about why. Okay. She went to Mass one day. Uh, black folks, mass is what the Catholics have, okay? We have service, they have mass. I know. The priest was chanting, you know, that stuff that the Roman Catholics do, that, 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 that stuff. It's not tongues, okay, like we know, but it was whatever it is that the priests do. Tina Marie decided to bust out into daylight, come here, don't want to go home. The mammy said she was embarrassed. Tina Marie was like, fuck, I was only two. What you expect from a two-year-old? True, true, true. Because I done did a lot of embarrassing shit at my grandmother's church down there to the Meridian Hill Baptist Church on 16th Street. Okay, some of y'all might not. Is it 16th and Park Road? But it's burnt down now. Okay, that needs to be investigated. But anyway, uh, yeah, I done did a racket, you know, shit to embarrass my grandmother's child. It happens. So then after that, let's say that her parents supported her in her endeavors to sing. She became a local talent. She even got a little small part on the Beverly Hillbillies. You youngins that's here, if you don't know what it is, Google it. At age nine, she moved from Mission Hills to Venice Beach. Yeah. Venice Beach was unlike Mission Hills. Mission Hills was predominantly white. Venice Beach was predominantly black. For Judy, Mickey, not Mickey Howard, but Mickey, um, who grew up with her down there to the Venice Beach, said that she didn't even know that Tina Marie was white until she saw her mother. So Tina Marie then moved on from formal piano lessons to teaching herself the type of music that she wanted to do. Her okay. Judy, Mickey, not Howard, said that their relationship further grow, grew once they knew that they had uh, a music type in common. They both loved Smokey Robinson. Girl, oh my God. 
God, he got that Beijing in his head, that Jerry Curl. Oh, I don't know if it's a rug or a wig. I don't know. I don't understand why that man is so old and still got a head full of hair. I don't go, I don't know. Okay, I don't know. But that child, he was feeling all. I said, ooh, somebody must have gay smoke at the Robinson or e pill because that nigga is feeling himself. Now, moving on. At 12 years old, Tina Marie uh, had formed a group with her family. Okay. She said that it was somewhat like the Partridge family. Ugh, I hate sometimes that I'm so old, but if you don't know what the Partridge Family is, Google it. It was a show that came on in like the 60s and 70s, and it was about a musical family. She said she went on to Venice High School and joined musical theater. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, because she was a little out of pocket there, she had got kicked out of one of the shows because they caught her ass smoking the wacky stick. Um, later, Tina Marie's Judy, Mickey, not Howard, Okay, put together a band, okay, uh, made a demo, and then headed towards Hollywood. Now, they didn't live in Hollywood, so every day they on the bus with guitars. I think they said they were on the bus for like four hours. On the Jesus? On the Jesus! Now, in 1975, Motown moved from Detroit to Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Marvie Pooh talked about that, and Rickety James talked about that. But she said Tina met with exec Hal Davis, and he took her straight to Burry the Gordy. Burry the girl Gordy loved her. Now let me tell you something: that unsung hit the chop. They go the dummy chop again. I be having to give your ass. Why? Okay. Tina Marie was not popping off the way that they wanted her to was because they were trying to brand her as a white artist. Back and watch my uh, Rickety James uh, book recap and review, okay? Because you know Rickety James said that they was pimping around there to the Motown, and I believe it, okay? They was around there, you know, selling records and selling vaginas. Now, okay. fearful that she was going to get dropped from the label, her uh, manager by the name of Min not Minnie, Winnie, Okay, not Mandela. Okay, Winnie had made a group with her and two of Barry DeGordy's sons to uh, include, um, what's his name? Somebody, Benny Medina. What she wasn't banking on when she got this little group together was the fact that the three little boys was going to be ignorant as hell and act immature and be ignorant. They would say uh, misogynistic things about women like, ooh, look at them big boobs, okay? And Tina Marie looking around like, look at them big boobs. Shit, I'm the only one with boobs here, so I guess they, are they talking about me? Now, on yeah. one day, one particular day, she was fed up, okay? She told the boys or the dudes, the three dudes, three dudes, I'm going to be back, okay? That bitch ain't come back, okay? What she did was drove her ass all the way home and told Winnie, not Mandela, but the manager, okay? Uh, you need to get me out this group, girl. Enters Rickety James. Ooh, I'm just a sucker for your love. Sucker for love. Same thing that Rick James said in his book Glow was that they was trying to get him to work with her because they felt like because he had so much credit in regards to, like they say, street cred, that anybody that he worked with would work. And it's true. So anyway, in 1979... She had an album that Rickety James helped her to make or create. It was wild and peaceful, okay? And this album did not have her face on it. Barry DeGordy at the time believed in sometimes people judge people uh, by their face. Unsung, listen, you cleaned it up real good, but the fact of the matter is this. He did not want to turn his audience off with seeing a white face on it. The same way that they did not want to turn the white audience off with having black faces on the cover. That's why sometimes you would see black groups and they would have white dudes on the cover. You'd be like, what the fuck? But that's how it was back in the day. And I remember it like it was yesterday. Tina Marie and Rickety James appears on Soul Train. Now, it's bad enough that we all knew that they wasn't singing, singing for real. You know, they was always, you know, what is that, Millie Vanilli? What's that word when you, I don't know, lip syncing. That's it, right? So when Tina Marie came on stage, bitch, I'm eight. I'm baffled. 
Okay, I don't know what is going on here. Is this trickery, Grandma? 1979, I'm in Searchman Quarters watching TV with my grandmother. Saturday at 5 o'clock, okay? Child, Rickety James and Tina Marie came on. I'm like, why is that white lady, Grandma, why is that white lady singing for that lady? What is going on? Is, is Tina Marie sick on mothers? You heard me, on mothers. I, didn't, I did not believe that that was Tina Marie. Okay, I don't, th I don't, I think, did I have to see an album or something? I was eight. It was a concern to me. But that's okay. when Tina Marie was introduced to us. That's when we found out that that was a teeny weeny white lady that could belt. You hear me? Like a black woman. Now her mammy told her, uh, Tina, why don't you marry Rickety James? He has a lot of money. He's a rich man. She said, Ma. You would never, ever want me to be with that dude, ever. That is the last dude you want me to be so, with. So, forgive the wardrobe change, guys. I know you're like, Nay, what are you doing? I'm editing the video, but while I'm editing the video, I realized that I forgot some things that were left out. In yeah. Rick James' book, Glow, what he said about Tina Marie was that Tina Marie was actually living with a friend, her um, manager, while she was working with um, uh, 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 Motown, okay? The reason why was because Tina Marie's family had uh, disowned her for having so many, mm, how can I say this without being, <sighs> where her, her family had uh, rejected her or shunned her because she had, too many relations or too much um, of her life encompassed African Americans. So she was basically thrown away by her family. Now, as usual, Unsung does not give you everything because they like to keep things clean. Anyway, okay. Tina Marie is on her second album. It's 1980 and a man named Richard Rudolph uh, helps her to create an album simply called Lady T. Lady T is the name that Rickety James calls her. The person, uh, what was his name? Something Rudolph. He is actually Minnie Ripperton's husband and Maya Rudolph's father. So now I see the connection as to why Minnie Ripperton chose Tina Marie as Maya's godmother. Back to the story. Tina Marie goes on to compare album number one with Rickety James to album number two with the dude Rudolph. Okay, number one was gritty, it was hard, it was funky, but album number two was polished. Next album number three, Irons in the Fire. She wrote, produced, and arranged that mother hunchy by herself, and it ended up in the top 10. At the same time, Rickety was finishing street songs to include Fire and Desire. And before pleasure. Ow, that sounds like anal sex. Don't it? Don't it? Oh, that's so messed up for me to say. Should I take that off? Okay, anyway, I'm moving on. This is for entertainment purposes, YouTube. Entertainment purposes only. Ricky That's James it. and Tina Marie, while they were working on street songs together, they documented themselves. They literally interviewed each other on how they were feeling and, you know, the creativeness between the two. At first, this is what Tina Marie say, at first, they was BFFs. Now they fucking, okay? Now, I'm gonna tell you this. Unsung A. Y'all, uh, like I say, y'all are famous for putting sugar on shit, okay? But Tina say that that motherfucker was terrible. Now, she kind of touched it because she said she didn't want to be number one. And then it's two, three, four, five, and six, and seven after that. The issue between the two was this. Tina Marie wanted a relationship with Ricky James, okay? But she wanted a monogamous relationship with him. Ricky James was not going to give her that. So in his mind, according to the book, Tina Marie was mad at him because he would not be with her. No, he would not be with her the way that she required. And he took that as, oh, she mad at me. You know how ninjas do. You know how ninjas do. They always holler, oh, she crazy. And for real, you're not saying the reason why the girl is crazy, you know, because you didn't fuck her stuff. So Rickety James also said that um, Tina Marie 
was demanding more money from him, okay? As a result of him not wanting to be in a relationship with her. So anyway, Tina Marie is saying Rickety James was taking money from her, okay? Meaning this, okay? There was, they were on tour together, okay? But there was one time that she was not going on stage with him or she was not going to perform with him in Houston. He tricked her and said, hey, just come on down. Come on down so that the people can meet you, okay? And when she got there, not thinking that she was going to perform, Rickety James hit her with, come on, Tina, come on, come on. Rickety James had already made a deal with the producer of the show or the promoter of the show that Tina Marie was going to sing Fire and Desire. Tina ain't getting none of the money. Rickety James got all the money. So Rick James, as much as I love him, I, I love me some Rickety James. But he was a he was a whole he was a piece of work. Now they on tour. Tina then said, "I don't want your ass no more." On the first day of the tour, the way that they sang "Fire and Desire" made audiences believe that they actually had a relationship. I never thought that, but it was a PR moment for Motown. So of course they capitalized on the conception or the perception that Tina Marie and uh, Ricky James. We're in a relationship. They were, okay? They ain't no more. Now, Miss Tina Marie is sick of Rick James and Motown. She, she's not sick of them in her heart, but she knows that she can be greater. There's, you know, more money out there for her. There's more things for her. And her supposedly BFF, Rickety James, was telling her that she needed to move on. So because he was her mentor, First, before he was her lover, she had got it in her mind that, oh, you know, Rick James has a lot of power at Motown. I'm going to move on. What the execs okay. at Motown were saying was that in actuality, Rick James couldn't deal with Motown splitting their attention between Tina Marie and him. He couldn't do that. It's funny how a lot of artists are very temperamental. And they need a lot of attention. So Rick James' mind is, no, you need to get rid of her. Because I need them to spend 100% of their time on me. Now, Smokey Robinson, you know, who at the time was the vice president of Motown, he confirmed that uh, I don't know what Ricky James told her, but he had no power to make no decisions at Motown. I believe it. She was younger than him. And I believe that his selfishness basically... Um, you know, pushed her away or pushed her in the direction of leaving Motown. And I think the straw that broke the camel's back was the fact that she didn't get no money from Fire and Desire or even had, or even let's say a portion of what she deserved in regards to Fire and Desire. Tina Marie is feeling a certain kind of way, okay? And all Motown wanted was for her to get back in the studio. Barry DeGordy admitted that he never took the step to call her personally and say, listen, I don't know what they told you, but you good here. What do you want? Now, Tina felt it was bad blood between her, Motown, and Barry DeGordy, which was not true, right? It was not true. But listening to the Rickety James, coupled with the fact that Barry DeGordy did not reach out to her, she gone. She gone right to... CBS Epic Records. Epic Records pursued her all the way down to her one bedroom apartment. Did they say Compton or Crenshaw or something like that? But she lived in a one bedroom apartment. And Epic was confused. They like, wait a minute, this girl got all these hits and all she living in is a one bedroom apartment. When she started recording for Epic. You know Motown, they don't give a fuck. They don't give a fuck. They sued. You might be like a daughter to me nigga, but I don't give a fuck. You over there making albums for other people. You need to be over here at the Motown. Tina Marie countersued and won. 1983 with the album Robbery, which contained one of my favorite songs, Dear Lover. Oh, I think I lost my virginity for the 45th time to that song. Moving on, we did Star Child with Lover Girl. That charted at number four. In 1988, she released Ooh La La La. Ooh, I did that wrong. Ooh, that was terrible. The problem was with um, Tina Marie, 
the same way it is with all R&B artists, was that she had no crossover appeal. Seven years and five albums later, in 1990, she left and she decided to be a mother. Now, in 1994, she financed on her own Passion Play, okay? It didn't do well, okay? And in fact, the album hurt her financially. Whereas her daughter is three or four years old now and she is in the alley selling these expensive guitars out of the back of her car. In regards to her godchildren, Minnie Ripperton's daughter, Maya Rudolph, who is playing on Saturday Night Live, she's very racially ambiguous. We don't know what she is. She could play black, white, whatever she wants to play, right? But she does identify as black. I'm not sure if she's married to a white man, a black man, I really don't know, I really don't care. But Tina Marie is also, or was also her godmother. In fact, at the either beginning or the end of one of Minnie Ripperton's songs, is it Back Down Memory Lane or Loving You? But you can hear Tina Marie softly calling Maya. Ten years later, while she's trying to rejuvenate her career, her friend, confidant, and mentor is going through troubles. Rickety James, oh, he is going, if he's at the bottom, he's at the bottom. You know, he messing around with that uh, lady. I forget that lady name. What's her name? Tawana, Tijuana, or something like that. I forget the lady's name, but his last wife, okay? They always on the camera, okay? In somebody's courtroom for smoking somebody's crack. Although okay. that Tina, you know, did have her issues with Rickety James, she still remained a friend with him and encouraged him to get himself together. But child, you can't, uh-uh. You won't lose against them drugs, that girl. Tina Marie, I don't care how good your vagina is. I don't good, care how good your sweet potato pie is. You know, it, it, I don't care how long your money is. Until that ninja's ready to stop doing whatever it is he's doing, you will always lose. Nay, Rob told you. In 2004, the two got back together to go on tour. Anyway, they back. It's 2004. They had the BET Awards, and they singing Fire and Desire, and that shit is a hot Met. I don't know what Ricky James was singing. I know what she was singing, but I don't know what he was singing, okay? It was a mess. His voice, I don't know. It, it, it wasn't strong. It was, she it said, was, even that nay, they was arguing. But that's their dynamic, you know? They fuss and fight. And she said he was just being ridiculous. But after they performed, you know, somebody looked at Ricky James and said, hey, Rick, you looking good. He responded to that person, that's because Tina keeps me in line. So although they was fighting, the last time she seen him, it was love. So after the awards, just a few months later, August 6, 2004, Ricky James passed from a heart attack. Although she missed her friend, she felt a sense of peace for him because he was no longer in pain. I can dig it. Just as Rickety James was passing and it was affecting the world, she had an album that was charting higher than any other album that she made, Ladonia, charted at number six. Then we had Sapphire. In 2009, her 13th album, Congo Square, which included MC Light, Faith, George Duke, and her daughter. Now, if you have not already done so, please remember to like, share, and subscribe because it is so important to my success here on the YouTube. And remember this, the same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. Naysayers, my patron loves. You have a good one.